So to begin with, Emma, what do you think of the film? I thought it was historically accurate, um, reflected some of the historical events. Um, I was very pleased about the portrayal of um, Nzinga because the first time I came across um, Queen Nzinga, I was sitting in the summer of 1999 in the George Padmore Library in Accra, Ghana. I was doing some research on Kwame Nkrumah and one of the nice things about research is sometimes you stumble on things outside of what you're, you've set yourself the target or the objective of researching. And I came across this article on Angola, Angola's 17th, um, 18th century history. And I came across this historical figure, Queen Nzinga, and I was profoundly impressed. And this was back in 1999. And I've been very much intrigued by the history of Angola, and particularly Queen Nzinga. And when I heard about this film being made, and David Somerset, the program director here, invited me to um, do the Q&A today, I wondered whether the film, um, in my mind's eye, would portray Nzinga according to the images that I had of Nzinga being very... Um, proud, being very ambitious, being a very profoundly intelligent strategist, diplomat and warrior. But I also wondered whether they would portray the scene whereby she meets the governor, um, Correa de Souza. And I think that's a very powerful scene and it's actually recorded in the historical documents as a painting by a Dutch artist that depicts when she meets Correa de Souza, he thinks it's African etiquette to place a cushion on the, ch on the floor. And that is um, the height of um, insults or insubordination um, according to um, Mbundu culture. But what happens, as we saw there, um, very powerfully depicted in the film, um, Nzinga's maidservant becomes a human chair and she sits on the back of her maidservant and conducts, as we see very skillfully, negotiations with the, with the Portuguese. So I think that particular image for me stayed in my mind as I, when I read um, this article back in 1999. I wondered whether the film would portray it, and it does so wonderfully, very powerfully, um, I think. So Nzinga, I think, comes across um, very strongly um, as I said, as a politician, as a diplomat, as a strategist, um, as, as a leader. She, we physically see her going into battle um, with her, her, her men um, against the Portuguese. And we see a great amount of um, African agency. Um, and I think this is very important um, in terms of films. We very rarely see Africans, and particularly African women, um, being, you know, center stage, controlling and making political decisions and confronting material circumstances and making political choices and personal choices um, as well. So I think it is, um, it's a wonderful film, but yes, it's very rare for us to see images of African women portrayed on the big screen, let alone in soaps or in TV dramas. So mm. this is wonderful. Yeah, there is one film I'm aware of, I've not actually seen it myself, it's called um, Sarunia mm, um, by right. a guy called Med Hondo. That's and I've right. never actually seen that film, but it's about another Sarunia. African warrior mm. queen who was, in fact, Amy, you want to talk about who Sarunia was? Yes, so I have seen the film a very long time ago, Med Hondo, I think he's um, Mauritanian, if my memory serves me correct. And she likewise fights against, fights against the French this time mm. as European colonizers. Um, and both Sarunia and Queen Nzinga essentially are fighting for the political sovereignty, independence of their lands. Um, because we have to remember that colonialism was, was an enactment of violence. Um, violence against the people of Sarunia, Sarunia's people and the Mbundu people that um, Queen Nzinga represented. And we see this violence on a number or a multiplicity of levels. We see this violence politically. African people were denied you know, their, their rights to self-determination. We see it on a cultural level. They were denied their 
um, culture, their histories, their religions. And we also see it socially and psychologically, um, as well as economically, the fact that um, Nzinga um, was defying the Portuguese access to, to markets and trade. And likewise, Sara Unha was fighting against French encroachment in her land um, in the region now, I think today is known as, um, is now presently Senegal, um, come um, Mauritania, that region in West Africa. Um, it's a very powerful film and wonderful if the BFI could show that film um, again. Right, I'll add it to the list. Um, apart from Serunia and Nzinga, there's a couple of documentaries about a woman called, a queen rather, called Yar Santua. Mm -hmm. And Yar Santua is another warrior queen who fought, mm -hmm. in this case, against the British in four different wars that I'm aware of. So again, there's actually, a, if I can come back up to you, I mean, there's a, is there a huge history about African women who fought back? Absolutely, there is, um, um, Tony. Um, there, you've mentioned Yara Santuar in Zimbabwe. There was Queen Enhanda of the Shona people um, in Kenya. There's a, a, a woman that I only recently stumbled upon um, called Mekatili wa, ma, wa Menza. Mekatili wa Menza. And she was of the Jirama people, and she again resisted the British and their domination of um, the Jirama people. Again, very little is known about her, and the Kenyan people have, in the last three, four years, have put up um, a, a statue to commemorate Mekatilili Wamenza. Um, there are many others um, that need to be honoured. And I think those who also fought in the national liberation struggles in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, in Angola, in Mozambique, in Guinea-Bissau, many of the nameless and voiceless African women who were guerrilla fighters who fought in these wars of national liberation and independence, as well as in the um, struggles in, in Kenya, the Mau Mau, the land and freedom um, party, um, land of freedom party um, veterans are often commemorated as being male, but many of their foot soldiers were also women um, who helped to, to fight for independence uh, for Kenya. So there are many known and unknown um, women sheroes in our history um, that need to take centre stage, that need to be remembered, that need to be documented, um, that we need to, you know, shine a light on. Going back to Queen Zinga's political maneuverings, there were lots of alliances and strategic mm. plan there. Can you tell us a bit more about the actual situation for Queen Zinga when she was fighting against the Portuguese and the Portuguese's African allies? It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a very complex okay. um, period um, in Angola's in history. And to try and um, condense it, I think um, one of the weaknesses I'd make of the, the film is that it didn't go into the complexity of the fact that the Portuguese weren't just fighting the Ndongo, the Mwundu people, um, represented by Angola and Bandi, Queen Nzinga's brother, and then Queen Nzinga herself when she occupied the throne. But there were over a dozen other kingdoms in the region that we know as Angola today at the time. And therefore, there was a complexity of political realignments. As we, we got a glimpse of that um, in, the, in the film. And certainly, um, the Mbundu people you know, tried to sue for peace um, with the Portuguese. Angola and Bandi did that by sending his sister um, in Zinga as emissary to um, gain peace with the Portuguese. And he did that in 1622, and he did that again because the Portuguese renegaded on the peace treaty in terms of moving the prison um, from Mbaka and also expelling the Jagas, who were a mercenary band of um, Africans that the Portuguese had allied themselves with. And so during this complex period from around 1622, when Nzinga was sent as an emissary, till the death of Nzinga in 1663, um, there was a great deal of um, you know, shenanigans or maneuverings, not just the Portuguese, but also the Dutch 
encroach on the scene um, from around 1641. And for Nzinga, or for the Mbundu people, the fact that another European power enters the scene, um, this is represented by the Dutch, it gives them the opportunity to ally with another European power against the Portuguese. But this does backfire, because as we saw in the film, the Portuguese then not only occupy Luanda from between 1641 and 1648, but then the Dutch also duplicitously turn around and ally with the Portuguese yeah. against Nzinga and the Mbundu people. And so therefore, Nzinga is up against both the Dutch and the Portuguese and has to um, eventually in 1656 sign a peace treaty um, with the Portuguese that enables her to be recognized as the sovereign um, power representative as queen of, um, of Ndongo. But it is a very complex period mm. of um, alignments, realignments, and the Portuguese encroachments into the territory of Ndongo and elsewhere. And one of the reasons why the Portuguese entered into the Peace Treaty of 1656 is that they wanted to gain access to other areas of uh, Angola, the territory that we know as Angola. Um, other, they wanted to suppress and subordinate other kingdoms. And Nzinga um, represented a huge obstacle in terms of access to the slave markets of Matamba. And we see Nzinga there um, become a very powerful sovereign um, ruler in terms of extending her own power and conquering a neighboring kingdom, the kingdom of Matamba. And once Nzinga is contained, as the Portuguese view it, they can then move on and con conquer other regions of what is present day um, Angola. Hmm. And one thing I should say actually, um, about the name Angola um, that's very um, ironic, or many people don't know, is that Angola is called present-day Angola because when the Portuguese arrived, they mistook the name Angola, N-G-O-L-A, meaning ruler, in the Kumbundu language, they mistook that, meaning ruler, for Angola, the country. And that stuck. And that region of Angola, or the Ndongo land, is a very specific region, and it was a kingdom, one of many kingdoms, but they called that place, or that region, Ndongo, Angola, and the whole area later became known as Angola, but there were many other kingdoms and peoples and entities, polities that existed, um, but Angola was a mispronunciation or a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation of Angola meaning ruler or king, for the people or the territory that it then later became um, known as. In the movie, they made lots of references to Christianity and how it was used. Mm. So from your perspective as a historian, um, how did the Portuguese Europeans use religion to advance their economic interests? Well, when the Portuguese um, arrived in the coast of Angola from around um, 1483, this is um, at least 100 years before Nzinga herself was born. She was born around 1581, some historians say, or 1583. When the Portuguese arrived, apart from their economic interests, they also had religious or evangelical interests to Christianize um, um, the region and the peoples, to bring Christianity to so-called heathen people. And this they also pursued alongside their, their economic um, interests. So religious and economic motives um, coincided, went hand in hand. And what is um, fascinating about the, the region that is known as West Central Africa, that covers the five countries of um, Cameroon, Central African Republic, um, Congo Brazzaville, DRC, and Angola, collectively known as West Central Africa, is that when the Portuguese arrived on the coast in the, in the 1500s, unlike um, the Upper Guinea coast of West Africa, what we see with the Portuguese engagement, um, encroachment on African land, is we see that they brought about a cultural kind of synthesis and cultural penetration in terms of influencing Africans um, through religion to take on 
African names, mm. the Christian Catholic religion, um, Portuguese, European dress and mannerisms and foodstuffs that were integrated into African culture. And this has become known in the literature as Creole or Creolization that Africans, not just blindly, but they also took aspects of European culture and European names um, to advance their own interests. Um, and this kind of cultural synthesis or creolization is very distinct to West Central Africa, unlike the Africans who were enslaved from West Africa, who tended to retain their own cultural and religious um, um, beliefs when they were exported to, to the Americas. And it's depicted in the film, in the background, and it's all depicted in the film, but it's not pointed out, but in the historical records, Queen Nzinga, as part of the negotiations of 1622, she adopts or baptizes, becomes baptized and it becomes Christianized, and she adopts the name Donna Anna de Souza. Mm -hmm. Anna de Souza, um, it's believed by historians, she chose that name in order to strengthen her links with the Portuguese governor, um, Correa de Souza. And this was not just with um, Christianity or Catholicism. It should also be noted that when she um, became intimate, had relations with um, the Jaga leader, Casagangola, she um, also took on the ways of the Jaga people, not depicted in the film, but certainly in the historical literature. Um, Kasangola, who becomes, you know, um, um, love struck, he's blinded by her beauty and falls in love with her. He does not see that she has larger political ambitions. And neither does um, Kasanji, the other Jaga warrior um, that she allies with for, again, political um, um, reasons. But throughout her life, um, Queen Nzinga um, used culture, um, accommodated herself to culture in terms of Christianity, in terms of aligning herself with the Jagas, the warriors, for more strategic objectives um, in terms of abandoning um, Kasangangola when he was no longer useful to her, and the same with Kas Kasanji um, as well. Um, so in answer to your, your question, um, Portuguese colonialism was, we have to remember, a settler colonialism. That is, the Portuguese, as did um, the, the British settlers in Kenya and in South Africa, they came to um, Luanda, Angola, intending to duplicate Lisbon in Luanda. That is, to bring their own culture, um, to um, reinforce and to bring their cultural ways, their way of life, to create little Lisbons, to create little Britons um, in Kenya, in South Africa. And they had um, uh, an elite. They had collaborators, African collaborators, um, who actually um, became known as Lusophone um, Africans, Africans who assimilated, um, who were near colonial. We can call them collaborators, puppets. Um, you know, um, they were vassals. Um, who essentially, you know, um, integrated into the culture, into the mindset of European values, European dress, European language, um, European ethos. Um, so these Luso Africans, as they became known, we see them also in the background in the scene when Nzinga and her entourage come to Luanda um, to negotiate the deal. She's walking through in terms of the party, the social gathering. We see some um, Luso Africans, those of dual heritage um, or, or mixed race Africans, part Angolan or part um, Mbundu, part um, European. We see them in the background um, there. Um, they have taken on you know, European Portuguese ways of life and have become Luso African. We've heard about Queen Zinga, Yasantwa, uh, and Bina Handa. Mm. From your experience, do they have any kind of European equivalents of queens who literally fought in battles for their people in the 16, 17, 1800s that any European queens did something similar? Um, any queen that comes to mind is Elizabeth I, um, who was on the throne here around 1596 or so. Mm -hmm. And that comes to mind because she's mentioned in um, 
the wonderful book Peter Fryer, Staying Power, A History of Black People in Britain. But Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I, uh, I'm not sure whether she was engaged in any kind of conquests or battles mm. um, in terms of within England with the, <laughs> the Irish or the Scots. I think Oliver Cromwell did a, 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 you know, a conquest in terms of conquering the Irish and the Scots. But Queen Elizabeth I comes to my mind because in Peter Fryer's book, he mentions that she sought to deport black people um, people of African descent known as the Moors, the Blacker Moors, who existed in this country around that time, and she referred to the Blacker Moors as, quote, those kind of people who needed to be deported from her, her kingdom. Mm. So if she was not engaged in, in conquests <laughs> of other peoples, um, she certainly wasn't treated people with um, a, a different skin colour within her realm um, mm. with any kind of humanity. It just makes me think because we can think of a good number of examples of black women, African women in Africa who literally led their armies into battle in the 16, 17, 1800s. But in your experience, when did European women get the right to fight alongside the men in wars in the last 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, or whatever? Because there's been, uh, I mention that because it kind of shows a different perspective when it comes to women and the role of women in societies in that we can have, we have a whole bunch of examples of African women who are literally fighting in the battlefields alongside the men, leading the men actually, whereas in Europe, mm. so European society, if you think about when have women been allowed to even fight in modern warfare, that is last 20, 30, 40, 50 years maybe. So it's a bit of a different step. One more thing before I take the audience. Um, they mentioned Brazil a lot. Um, what connections or similarities do you know between Angolan culture and Brazilian culture, are there any sort of carryovers? Did the people who fought and were captured by um, the Portuguese, they were still in the slavery? And I'm just wondering if that mm. history culture continued in, in Brazil. Okay. Before I answer your question, Tony, I think one of my misgivings about the film is I, I think the interconnections between the various wars, conflicts, battles, and there were many. Um, the Portuguese conquered Angola in 1575. It was not until 1975 that Angola attained independence. So 400 years of enslavement and colonial domination and settler colonialism. 400 years, I repeat that. And I think in the film, what doesn't come out very clearly are the interconnections between these wars, the factionalism, the civil disputes. I think the civil disputes and the internecine quarrels between Mbandi and his sister Angola, that comes out very strongly. And they're very um, strongly reflected in the historical records, not just of the Ndongo kingdom, but also the Congo kingdom, which was another kingdom um, to the north of Ndongo. These civil strife um, within the royal kingdom um, made it very easy for the Portuguese um, to gain leverage in terms of backing one faction within the royal kingdom against another. Mm. And the factualism of the civil strife, the point I want to make, is that it provided an opportunity for war to create instability and therefore um, war, prisoners of war and for war to be the, um, the, the, the basis upon which captives could then be sold into slavery. So that connection, I feel, is not brought out very strongly mm. in terms of how war and the Portuguese instigated these wars became the basis through which their slave captives and Angola became a reservoir to supply the Americas and Brazil with war captives. And again, very few people are aware of the fact that a quarter of African Americans today can trace their origins to Angola. But a quarter of African Americans are uh, historically derived in terms of their genealogy, their lineage, came from Angola. So again, that is a link that I think you know, remains very tenuous, very vague in, in the background. But certainly to answer Tony's um, question, um, Brazil had the highest population of enslaved Africans arriving on its shores um, until it um, um, essentially um, ceased um, the slave trade in the late um, 19th century. And many of those um, slaves who came from Angola, uh, many of them were Africans with you know, came from warrior traditions, came from a background whereby they were very proud of their culture and their traditions. And it's known in northeastern 
Brazil, Bahia. Um, but one of these um, 17th century slaves was Ganga Zumbi. Yeah. Um, Ganga Zumbi um, hailed from Angola and he fought against the Brazilians um, for over, well, his um, 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 Quilombo? Quilombo or Palmares. Um, Palmares was the name of um, his um, um, slave or uh, free um, fugitive settlement um, whereby he set up um, a community, a society of freed Africans um, that the Brazilians, the Portuguese, sought to suppress. And it took the Portuguese um, over 100 years to suppress Ganga Zumbi um, and, his, and, and his people. But Ganga Zumbi and many of the enslaved Africans that were sent to Brazil hailed from, in terms of their origins, came from uh, Angola. Um, and that is oft also the case for enslaved Africans who went to Venezuela, um, and many South American um, um, countries. I think that's a very good um, question. And I think it's also a reflection of um, Portuguese colonialism and the impact that it had on um, Angolan people or the many peoples in Angola, and they come from different ethnic groups, and particularly the elite, Angolan elite, who have adopted um, Portuguese as their, their language. And I think we need to confront the fact that, as I said, one of the detrimental negative impacts of colonialism was that it stripped us of our culture. It stripped us of our pride in knowing who we, we, we are and who we were in terms of instilling, inculcating shame and hatred, self-loathing in our names, in our languages, in our culture. And to a certain extent, that was one of the impacts of creolization or um, a particular elite or segment of Angolan people imbibing Portuguese um, culture and language as the national language. And I think that's a question that perhaps could be asked of the actors um, and actresses in this film as to why they didn't speak um, Kimbundu, which is the language of the Mbundu people, um, rather than speaking um, Portuguese. Um, but I do see it as, um, as an aspect of you know, settler colonialism whereby um, an elite of Africans, a segment of Africans, um, imbibed colonialism um, you know, wholesale um, and were instilled with this um, self-hatred, internalized racism um, in terms of near colonialism, aligning with the values, ethos, aspirations of their colonial masters. And that is reflected to a certain extent in the fact that um, you know, many of them, even to this day, um, speak um, Portuguese. Some people may argue that you know, um, Portuguese or English or French, because the same phenomena happens, has happened in Francophone African countries or Anglophone um, British, Afri British countries um, that were colonized um, by the British, that um, these you know, countries, African countries, still continue to have the languages of the colonial masters as the national language. I think that raises questions that we as African people on the continent in the diaspora need to you know, reflect on, contend with, have exchange um, with in order to learn African languages and to keep African languages um, alive and, and you know, spoken so that they do not become um, languages that, that die. Mm. <clears throat> oh, that's a very difficult question um, to, to answer. I think... Um, you know, politics, politics is entangled with issues of, of peace and of conflict, so you have to be um, uh, a military strategist as well. But you also have to know, as it says very powerfully in the film, I think she says to Injali, her counsellor, sometimes you, you need to know when to make one step forward in order to make two steps backwards. <laughs> or one step... 
Thank you for the correction. Two steps forward and make one step backwards. Um, <laughs> or, <laughs> I think you know what I mean, because you're correcting me. <laughs> um, but you, you certainly know what I mean. And I think she, was, she had that vision um, to be able to see that she had to marry the, the Jaga warriors um, in order to again fulfill her um, um, ambition. What wasn't shown in the film was the fact that um, she was a diplomat in terms of she made alliances also with um, the Jesuit priests and she also allowed the Jesuit priests to build um, uh, a church in the um, capital of um, Matamba. That wasn't shown in the film, but it's in the historical records. She also made um, alliances with the Luso Africans um, as well. Um, those were um, Africans and who were both of African and Portuguese um, um, descent. So she was very skilled, and it's very hard to disentangle, you know, the, the politician in her, the diplomat in her, the, the military strategist in her. I think the, the, all three um, tendencies, all three skills um, were very highly, you know, um, interconnected. Um, and enabled her to make decisions. Um, sometimes that they were decisions perhaps that we would um, have reservations about making, because in the historical record, it also remains inconclusive as to whether she authorized by poisoning the death of her brother in Bandy. And it's yeah. also inconclusive in the historical records as to whether she, being the royal regent who was in charge of her nephew, Carlu, whether she again authorized or had a hand in his killing. So these kind of add to some of the um, nuances and political shrewdness um, or political ambition, profound political ambition on the part of, of Queen Nzinga. Um, but to answer your question, I think you know, those skills are, are hard to disentangle. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, Queen Nzinga, um, according to the historical record, she led a very long life and much of her life, good 40 years or so, was fought um, against, she was fighting against the Portuguese. Um, she was queen of the Ndonga people and also conquered the neighboring kingdom of Matamba. She died at the ripe old age of around 83, 84, on the 17th of December, 1663. And when she died, um, as she had earlier um, concluded a peace treaty with the Portuguese of 1656 that recognized her as Angola of Matamba and Ndongo. And part of the peace treaty, this was a peace treaty that she um, signed with the Portuguese that was a very uneasy peace because neither the Portuguese nor um, the Ndongo people trusted one another. But by this time, an, um, Queen Nzinga accepted the fact that many of her alliances were breaking down, um, or weakening rather, her alliances with the Jaga. So she decided to enter into this peace treaty of 1656 from a position of strength rather than a position of weakness. And part of that peace treaty um, with the Portuguese um, stated very clearly that the Portuguese would recognize her successor on her death. And her successor on her death um, was her sister, Mukambu or Kambu that we saw in the film, who became queen after she passed away in 1663. And when she passed away, she insisted upon being buried in her leopard skin. And there was one scene in the film, notice that she wore a leopard skin across her, her chest. She insisted on being buried in her leopard skin. And her sister Kambu also insisted against the defiance of the Portuguese that her sister in Jinga should be also buried with a bow in her hand and some arrows in, at her back in the coffin. 
Um, her sister believed that this represented the true warrior spirit of her sister, bow and arrow. And we see many times in the film, and Zynga instructing um, her people, even her sister, how to use a bow and arrow. So she was buried um, with those kind of cultural attributes and military um, symbols. So that is what became of Queen and Zynga. That's a very good question. Um, and again, it comes back to the point that I've made earlier in terms of the, the nature of settler colonialism and the kind of values and impact that it had on the psyche, on the identity of Angolan people, not just Angolans, but Mozambicans as well, and those Africans who were born and taken to um, Portugal, who see themselves as Portuguese. And I've come across um, Angolans um, who see themselves as Portuguese. But we should ask ourselves, is that any different from somebody born here of, let's say, Ghanaian parents, my parents are Ghanaian, who see themselves as black British? Or somebody born in Paris of Senegalese or from parents who are from Côte d'Ivoire who see themselves as French or an Algerian, somebody in Paris of Algerian parents who see themselves as French. Again, it's the impact, I put it down to the impact of um, colonialism. It's down to the impact of European colonial infiltration, indoctrination that has made us think of us ourselves as black British, as French, as Portuguese. Um, but your question has to be addressed in regards to the fact that the, the British, when they colonized much of West Africa and South Africa and Kenya, did not, like the French, inculcate in their colonial subjects or natives that they should aspire to be black British or to be um, Englishmen or English women. Whereas the French and the Portuguese did give their colonial subjects, the natives, the illusion or delusion, you may wish to put, to, to think that they could aspire to become Portuguese or to become French. In F France, it was known as assimilation. Hmm. And yeah. Franz Fanon talks about that in his work. Um, so does Aimé de Césaire from Martinique. Um, they talk about the fact that the cultural aspect of colonialism was profound in terms of affecting the values, the identity, the religion, the dress um, of, of Africans. And that is why today, this is how I interpret that some um, Angolans, I say some, not all, will see themselves and say they identify um, as Portuguese. This is a character-driven film in terms of the protagonist. The film is really about um, Nzinga and the people. It's a, it's a very humanized, it's a human story. And I think um, that comes across very strong, very powerfully, positively in the film. And as a historian, I think a lot of the complexity um, you know, of the of period is totally marginalized, does not come across at all um, in the film. But as, as, as a film director, you know, I think one has to make choices, just as if you're an editor of a, um, a newspaper or a newsletter, you have to make choices as to what goes in, what is left out. Um, you know, what should be your focus, what should be your theme. And I think it is um, a very you know, individual, protagonist-driven film about Nzinga and the choices that she, she makes and the material circumstances that she is confronted with. And it gives, you know, um, in terms of the human angle, in terms of her son being killed, um, the choices that she makes in terms of um, lovers, husbands, um, the fact that her sister, and it's true, her sisters were captured when the Portuguese attacked around 1629, 1630, and her sister, um, Kifunju, was drowned um, by the, the Portuguese. So those are, are true to the historical documentation. Um, but yes, I think 
if I were to be a film director, would I do it differently? Um, I, I certainly would, but then I always say, um, you know, perhaps we should go off and make our own films if we're not happy with, with a film. Oh, yeah. um, so that, <laughs> that's what we need to, to do. We need to see more films on, you know, different, from a different perspective, a different interpretation, different angle, um, and I would do the film differently if I were to come back in my next life as a film director. Mm -hmm. In terms of the crown, um, in terms of legitimacy as to who could occupy the throne, that is a question that bedevils in Dongo's history um, throughout, and also um, the neighboring kingdom of the Congo. Um, successionism, you know, who would be king, who would be queen, and particularly in the issue of um, Ndong Ndongo and Nzinga coming um, to power. We saw the, the clip there in the film of the Makota, that is the council deciding after the death of Angola Kiluanji who would succeed him. And there were some who believed that um, Nzinga's gender was a disqualifying factor. So certainly patriarchy, patriarchal attitudes or sexism um, existed. There were some who um, were not comfortable with the fact that a, a woman should occupy um, the, the throne. However, when um, her, her brother um, died or was poisoned um, and Nzinga did occupy the throne, she proved herself through her own actions. And in the historical record, it actually documents the fact that some of the Sobers, Sobers are in Bundu clan chiefs or um, lesser nobles, some of the um, Sobers um, who were initially dissatisfied with her um, her, her becoming queen, actually changed their minds, actually altered their opinion um, because they were won over by her, her commitment, her dedication, the fact that she proved herself as a warrior on, on the battlefield. And we see that scene again, it's reflected in the film um, with um, the death of, um, I think, the disrespected um, sober um, Angola Ari. Um, they now believe that it's Queen and Zynga that they should um, support, and therefore they give her their allegiance. Um, so she wins over um, some of the Sobers who were initially, um, um, you know, had reservations, were hesitant in supporting her. And again, another factor that leads to the legitimacy of um, Queen Nzinga is as she was forced to move out of her capital as a result of Portuguese attacks and flee, she fled eastwards towards Matamba. And as a result of the wars that um, were unleashed by the Portuguese, um, this created a situation of a refugee crisis. Refugees, um, prisoners of wars, many of these refugees and prisoners of wars also actually came to join um, Queen Nzinga's um, Quilombo, Queen Nzinga's kingdom, and remained faithful to her. So she increased the size of her kingdom um, in Donga and Matamba, and won new allegiances by soldiers and um, former prisoners of war, war, war who um, came over to um, you know, support her. Um, so eventually she you know, won and was admired um, by many people within her own kingdom in Dongo and also neighboring um, Matamba. But certainly um, we cannot discount the fact that um, patriarchal attitudes um, did exist, um, but eventually the majority of her people um, sided um, with her and supported her. <laughs>